Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. The tarp is on the field over at Comerica as Storm Tracker 4 shows some spotty rain around southeast Michigan. The weather tops our news here at 6. Paul says the threat of severe storms is diminishing, but this might be a poncho type of night for the Tigers and the fans. Yeah, especially those heading early and staying late. Uh, we have these scattered showers in the area right now, and we'll just kind of zoom in and on downtown Detroit and Wayne County. You can see this is all light stuff here. This is nothing, no uh, thunderstorm type activity. And to get back to the west a little bit here, you can see northeast, uh, basically northeast of uh, Ann Arbor, extending to southwest Oakland County, South Lyon, a little bit heavier shower there. But basically, most of the rest of the area, we're just talking about scattered light shower activity. And notice the stuff's ending from southwest to northeast. So if you're are heading out right now. For example, a good shot from our Mount Clemens Sky Cam there. Nice shot of the Clinton River. 70 degrees the temperature, 70 the dew point. So it's a steamy 70 degrees out there. Humidity is 100%. And if you're going to the game, again, we have showers between now and about 7 or 7.30. Then I think there's going to be a break until maybe 11 or so. So hopefully we'll be able to get that game in. All right, don't forget the local forecasters app has everything you need. If you're going to the game, watch our real-time radar just to kind of keep an eye on that stuff coming in for the uh, end of the game. It's free. Just go to the app or search under WDIV. See you back in a few minutes, guys. Oh, a message of support today from a community that knows the unique brand of grief Uvalde, Texas is feeling right now. Students at Oxford High walked out of class and formed a U for Uvalde on the football field. The purpose was a show of solidarity following Tuesday's deadly mass shooting. It's not the only message Oxford students were trying to send, though. Sean Lay live in Oxford tonight with more on this walkout, which was, Sean, also a protest. Exactly. A protest also, as you pointed out, a show of support for the heartbroken community of Uvalde. But feelings here still very, very raw. And the shooting this week just making that boil up again for some students saying, yes, they show support, but also sending a protest Two specific messages to school administrators here. From Sky 4, this is what it looked like on the Oxford High School football field today. A student organized walkout, and not just walking out in protest, but coming together to form a U for Uvalde, Uvalde, Texas, the scene of yet another school shooting that has taken our nation's breath away. Yeah, mm -hmm. 100%. Michael Waymaster says news of another shooting is like a punch in the gut after the deadly shooting here last November. I was shocked. I was like, another one? Are you serious? That's crazy. The walkout also had a message. More safety. Yeah, more yeah. safety, stuff more like safety. that. Aiden McTaggart tells us he and other students do not feel like Oxford administration is telling them everything they need to know about what happened and why when a student opened fire here. The fact that like, um, a lot of people at our school feel like things aren't being done enough for the school, you know, I mean, I think they're making an effort, but I feel like people want more. And some students tell us they do not feel safe. There's a demand for more security. More like security guards, more like just feel safe all around. Like you, won't, you want to feel safe all the time. Back here live in Oxford, we'll show you these flags lowered yet again here. Students telling us that they do want more safety here. They do want more uh, transparency when it comes to what happened here and why as they show support for the heartbroken families in Uvalde. We reached out to the superintendent here in Oxford to get his thoughts on today's walkout and the messages sent. Guys, we'll let you know if we hear back from him. We're live in Oxford tonight. Sean Lay, Local 4. Okay, Sean, thank you. Now, new information tonight as the nation continues to mourn the lives lost in the tragic shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde. Sadly, in addition to the 19 children and two teachers who were killed, We've now learned the husband of Irma Garcia, one of the two teachers killed, has passed away from a heart attack while preparing for his wife's funeral. Investigators now say reports the gunman in the Texas school shooting was confronted by a school safety officer were not correct. Police now say he was in the school for more than an hour before police shot and killed him. Texas DPS also says the door to Robb Elementary School appears to have been unlocked. He walked in unrestructed initially. So from the grandmother's house to the bar ditch to the school, into the school, he was not confronted by anybody to clear the record on that. The White House confirms President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden will visit Uvalde, Texas on Sunday to meet with the families 
of the victims. We saw it after the Oxford school shooting and it's happening again. The immediate response to Tuesday's tragedy has been increased police patrols at schools. But the proactive measures don't end there. Megan Woods joins us live from Wyandotte, just one of the places where schools and law enforcement are actively working together on safety measures against active shooters. Megan. Yeah, that's right. We're right outside of one of their schools and this fall the school district will have two school resource officers for the first time in years. Wyandotte police tell us that they recently hired a detective and an officer just for the district and they know that two are not enough. These are teachers. They should be teaching. They shouldn't be concerned about uh, active shooters or dangerous situations. That's not what they signed up for. Wyandotte's deputy chief of police believes there needs to be officers in schools. That's why they recently hired two of their own. They're going to be responsible for all 10 school buildings. That's 5,000 students plus staff. He says funding doesn't allow for more and other communities have the same challenge. Right now, how we handle it here is the school has that police officer for nine months out of the year, essentially. So they pay for about 75% of the salary for that police officer. Taylor Public Schools has one resource officer. This summer, they are installing a Bluetooth safety lockdown. alert lockdown system lockdown. called Smart Boot to add lockdown. another layer of security. Whatever emergency there might be, that, that will cut seconds down from the teacher calling the office, the office calling the police department. It will be like, you know, simultaneously. It's a $1.7 million investment, but they say it's worth it. This summer, they will also update current systems. And we'll be able to see directly on computers who's coming to the building, what are they coming for. Wayne County Sheriff's Department doesn't provide school resource officers, but in the last six months have seen a spike in churches and schools reaching out for active shooter training. And they should. You know, uh, these things are happening right here in our area, southeast Michigan. Several school districts, local school districts, are making changes in time for fall. We talked to that lockdown system company, and they say uh, several, multiple downriver school districts are signed on to get their system. Devin, Kimberly. Oh, Megan, with some districts, we see them struggling just to get one officer. I mean, yeah. funding is a big issue here for schools. That's right. And when we talked to Wyandotte Police Department, they were saying, call your elected officials, ask, ask them for more school funding so they can have school resource officers. Yeah. Okay, Megan, thank you. Uh, we also want to mention there's new insight tonight from one of the doctors who tried to save the lives of the Robb Elementary School shooting victims. The head of trauma surgery at UT Health San Antonio spoke pretty candidly with Lester Holt about his role in a tragedy like this one. To be able to help someone when they need it the most, it's, it's hard to express how, how rewarding it actually is really is. Uh, and, you know, children are incredibly resilient and, and special. And so it's incredibly rewarding. But it is also the worst possible thing to have to explain to a mom whose, whose child was normal at breakfast is now not here. More of that interview ahead at 6.30 as Lester anchors nightly news from Uvalde, Texas. All right, we turn now to the shakeup in the race for governor in Michigan. Five Republican candidates have been found ineligible to be on the ballot. State Elections Bureau found thousands of fraudulent signatures on petitions submitted by James Craig, Perry Johnson, Donna Brandenburg, Michael Markey, and Mike Brown. That's half the field. The Bureau recommended they be disqualified. Today, the bipartisan Board of State canvassers voted on that recommendation. Two Democrats supporting it, two Republicans against it. The tie vote means the candidates lose. Craig and Perry says they are going to ask the courts to now intervene. Brown has already already withdrawn from the race. The state court of appeals is speeding things up in the case over Michigan's 1931 abortion ban. The court setting a new timeline for advocates to make their voices heard in the state's lawsuit. Let's bring in our Grant Herms right now. Grant, this is a pretty significant change. Yeah, Kimberly, this speeds up the process to file briefs, which is how both sides of this talk to the court. It goes from about 110 days to just over a month, putting it right around the 4th of July, potentially right in line with that major decision on Roe from the U.S. Supreme Court. 
Two big moves in the fight over Michigan's 1931 ban on abortion. On Wednesday, the Court of Appeals moving to speed up the process over whether the state should keep in place that 90-year-old law from what would have stretched into the late summer. That deadline now set for July 5th. The court expecting challenges to a recent temporary stop to the law from the Court of Claims to come quickly. Also today, Governor Gretchen Whitmer saying in a new filing with the state Supreme Court, quote, there is no reason for the court to delay its consideration of these issues of vital state importance. Both developments come as those on either side of the debate have begun more forceful pushes. This week, Michigan Right to Life outlining their case against a proposed amendment making abortion access state law. And I want every Michigander to know how egregious and dangerous this anything goes abortion amendment is for our state. And Democrats today calling Republican opposition a full scale assault, saying the end of abortion access would be a slippery slope. I cannot stress enough how this will not stop with just abortion access. The fight over abortion on the fast track as the state braces for major decisions. Now, it was also supposed to be a pro-choice rally here this afternoon, but only two people showed up. They put up these signs here and some posts and left after about a half an hour. Now, again, that deadline that the appeals court has set is July 5th. No indication yet whether the state Supreme Court will intervene so far. In downtown Detroit, Grant Hearns, Local 4. Oh, we'll keep following it. Grant, thank you. The CEOs of America's biggest companies have gotten pay raises well above the rate of inflation. The same cannot be said for their workers. A new study shows us that gap. Plus, here's Dr. McGeorge. COVID and flu continue, but a new summer threat is popping up at some local doctor's offices, too. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Ahead, see the latest on what's going around near you and the best ways to avoid it.